Hello everyone, and welcome to episode 30. The episode today is about the future evolution of life on Earth. After all, what kind of history lesson would this series be if we didn't take a look at where we are now and predict where we're going into the future? In the previous episode, I talked about the Holocene Epoch. This 10 to 11,000 year period saw the emergence of agriculture and the rise of city-states, medieval kingdoms and caliphates and empires, and the eventual industrialization of the modern world. The civilizational momentum of 10,000 years brings us at the speed of time into the present moment. The present moment is like a single frame in a billions-year-long movie, and our exploration into the evolutionary roots of life has given us a window into the thousands of frames that preceded us. We can use this information to see what trends are currently pushing life in what directions, and we can make predictions about how this will affect life as the movie frames roll into the future. That said, it's important to understand that evolution as a process is opportunistic, not deterministic. Evolution happens in response to environmental pressures, and things like asteroid impacts or diseases or the eruption of a supervolcano, these events really can't be predicted with any accuracy. How species respond in the long term can't be predicted to any specificity beyond generalities or educated guesses based on similar precedents in the evolutionary record. Life on Earth has the momentum of 3.6 billion years of evolution, but it's coming up against some of the most rapid environmental change that the planet has ever seen. The industrialization of human civilization has led to widespread consumption of the planet's resources, and with it, the rapid destruction of many habitats and ecosystems. Deforestation is a huge problem in South America. Ocean acidification has led to the bleaching and death of most of the Great Barrier Reef. Droughts and heat waves are scouring the Middle East, and industrial runoff has polluted numerous rivers across almost all parts of the world. These, among many thousands of other problems, are all radically altering the surface of our planet, taking ecosystems that have been established for millions of years and deconstructing them in what, to our human eyes and lifespans, is a slow-motion chaos. The loss of habitat leads to species extinction, and scientists believe that the current rate of extinction is anywhere from 1,000 to 6,000 times the background extinction rate, or the rate at which species go extinct under normal circumstances. Some estimates go as high as 10,000 times the background extinction rate, leading to a total extinction event predicted to be tens of times more intense than most or all of the previous mass extinctions. Make no mistake about it. This current mass extinction event, the sixth mass extinction in Earth's history, is caused by human behavior. Our industrialization, our consumption, the expansion of urban sprawl and the expulsion of greenhouse gases, all of these things contribute directly toward the rapid alteration of ecosystems and the accelerating rate of extinction. We call this event the Holocene Extinction, because it's like the man-made exclamation point on the end of the Holocene Epoch. The extent of our Holocene extinction reaches further than any disease or volcanic eruption or earthquake. Our influence on the planet rivals an asteroid impact, and perhaps even supersedes that in its raw destruction. Where an asteroid strike is immediate, blanketing the world in ash and dust within a year and causing a spike in extinction shortly afterward, our impact is like an accelerating current, a wave built on the energy of the waves that preceded it. At first, our behavior had little effect on the global climate. We cut down trees and burned fields, making room for our grazing animals. Then we began hunting megafauna to extinction and burning oil and gas. Our industry developed and expanded, and now we're at a point where concrete replaces forest and field, where lakes and rivers are polluted with industrial runoff, where chemicals and bits of plastic saturate the world's ecosystems and disrupt ecologies that have been stable for millions of years. Perhaps the most drastic ecological collapse in the extinction event involves the amphibians. The poor amphibians are being absolutely devastated by the changes in the climate, largely due to their vulnerability as a clade. You see, the amphibian life cycle involves stages that are both on land and in water. As larvae, amphibians dwell in bodies of water like ponds, lakes, swamps, and rivers. As adults, they live on land, typically in moist areas like tropical jungles, swamps, wetlands, and other hot, humid regions. This means they're affected by pollution and environmental changes in both the land and the water. Where animals like moose or jaguars are only affected by terrestrial changes, and animals like sharks and whales are pretty much only affected by aquatic changes, 
the amphibians are vulnerable to twice the pollution and environmental degradation. Furthermore, amphibians don't have dry skin, or thick scales, or watertight feathers. They have highly permeable skin that's really absorptive of chemicals in the air and water. Runoff from mining sites, industrial wastes, pesticides, and other foreign chemicals are all easily absorbed by an amphibian's skin, which makes them particularly vulnerable to these kinds of contaminants. Many of these chemicals and pollutants have horrible effects on the amphibian populations. They can cause grotesque malformations like extra arms or legs, deformed eyes, or just totally failed development that leads to stillborns or higher rates of infant and child mortality. Pesticides and herbicides can screw with hormone regulation or outright kill tadpoles and larvae. When even a small amount of estrogen contaminates an amphibian's habitat, like the estrogen used in industrial agriculture, it turns entire populations of tadpoles female. This can be disastrous because a population of sexually reproducing species with all females and no males can't reproduce. Within a generation, the population crashes. The amphibians are even being affected by the ultraviolet radiation coming through an ozone layer weakened by pollution. The increased radiation damages the DNA in the vulnerable amphibian eggs, and this causes disastrous mutations and malformations. Atmospheric changes are destabilizing the habitats of amphibians across the world, making them drier and either too hot or too cold for the sensitive creatures. As if all of this wasn't bad enough, human activity and human-caused environmental changes are encouraging the spread of diseases and funguses that ravage amphibian populations. It's unfortunate that the amphibians are being so heavily damaged by climate change and industrialization, and it's even worse that effects to conserve and protect them were slow to start and gain momentum. It's really kind of depressing, but it's quite likely that the amphibians will be unable to evolve a way to endure climate change. It's quite likely that most, if not all, amphibians will be driven into extinction by human activity and the changes that we're wreaking on the world. I mean, just consider everything they have going against them. A vulnerable life cycle doubly affected by pollution, permeable skin that makes them so much more vulnerable to environmental contaminants, atmospheric changes that make their habitats unlivable, not to mention pathogens and fungal infections and UV radiation. With all these things and more working against the amphibians, their future does not look bright. Imagine a world where amphibians have been ground into extinction. What would this world look like? Well, first, consider what amphibians eat. Their diet is based on the creeping things of the humid habitats, like beetles, ants, spiders, caterpillars, and worms. With the disappearance of amphibians, all of these creatures will enjoy a world without numerous predators. Without the regular predation of the amphibians, these bugs and worms will experience population explosions. Because all living things are connected ecologically, this population explosion will have major downstream effects. Whatever plants that the insects eat will suffer from massive swarms that strip them clean of foliage. Whichever animals also eat those plants for food will suffer from food shortages, as they're not used to this kind of competition from such a huge insect population. These herbivores will be forced by circumstance to find other food sources, which is essentially a selection pressure that fuels adaptation and diversification. Through an ecological chain of causation, the extinction of the amphibians will cause their prey populations to explode, which will lead to greater foliage consumption and the subsequent starvation and diversification of the herbivores that required that foliage for food. Animals that eat amphibians will also suffer, as amphibian extinctions would directly reduce the quantity of food that's available to them. Consider that amphibians are relatively low on the food chain. They're soft and squishy, sometimes poisonous, and they feast on bugs, which are literally right above dead and dying organic matter on the food chain. The only thing below that is dirt. Because the amphibians themselves are so low on the food chain, this implies that they're an important part of the diet of numerous animals that sit above them in the food chain. If the amphibians were to go extinct, everything that eats them and everything that eats the things that eat the amphibians would all have to deal with this fallout. The things that eat amphibians would have to deal with a lack of food, and as they all starved to death and their population shrank, their predators would have to deal with that. And this goes on and on, up the chain of ecological causation. On the other hand, an explosion in the populations of beetles, spiders, worms, and other bugs and stuff means more food for whatever else preys on those things. Frogs and salamanders and newts aren't the only creatures that eat these bugs. 
Other predators include fish, birds, and a lot of small mammals. A boom in their food source will necessarily be followed by a boom in their own populations, as more food means a larger population can be supported. More birds and fish mean more food for predators higher up the food chain, like bears and predatory birds. Perhaps these increases in bird and fish populations will make up for the decreases in herbivore populations. Maybe it can balance out. You know, the same herbivores who suffered from their food sources being eaten up by all of the insects that are no longer getting eaten by the amphibians. But this seemingly benign ending could take a dark turn. What if the amphibians were a huge part of the diet of numerous species, too big to be replaced by an alternative food source? If the rise in insects couldn't overcompensate for the loss of amphibians in the diet of their mutual predators, the predators will necessarily starve to some degree as their available food resources shrink. Consider species of predatory birds like herons, cranes, and seagulls, or fish like pike and trout, or reptiles like snakes, turtles, and lizards, and mammals like otters and rodents. All of these animals prey on amphibians, and if the shift to insects as a primary food source can't fill the caloric gap, those predators will necessarily experience more starvation and their populations will be forced to shrink. This would undoubtedly have upstream effects, as any predators who eat the herons and trout and snakes will similarly suffer from diminishing food resources. As species go extinct, they leave holes in the ecology of their habitat. Other species adapt to fill the hole, to fill the niche, as they say, which promotes speciation. But before that can happen, the ecosystem is destabilized. All the organisms that depended on the extinct species for food or for a symbiotic relationship or a mutualist relationship all of those species would suffer as well. Even those organisms that depended on the peripheral waste or the debris of another species, like the small fish that clean the teeth of larger fish, or the birds that peck food out from between the teeth of a hippo, even these species would be negatively affected if their mutualist or their symbiote partner, or so-called host, went extinct. The effects that I'm discussing here aren't just limited to amphibians and the organisms they interact with. It applies to literally any organism. Any organism that goes extinct will leave significant ripples behind in the ecology of their former habitat. As you can probably tell, I could go on all day about the hypothetical evolutionary paths, the possible extinctions, and the potential ecological ramifications of all of these things. So, I will. That's what this episode is all about. Predictions on the future of evolution. As the atmosphere warms up, the ocean warms up. Both the surface of the ocean and the ocean itself are getting warmer, and this can have serious consequences on currents and atmospheric climate. You see, ocean currents shuttle around cold and warm water. Where warm water comes to the surface, the air is warmed and the local climate can be unusually warm given its latitude. This happens for the Pacific coast of North America, where a warm current moves northward past Washington State and Canada up to the southern coasts of Alaska where it warms the air and supports a stunningly beautiful temperate rainforest ecology. If the ocean warming scuttles the currents or alters their flow in some way, ecosystems like the rainforests of the Pacific Northwest can be destroyed. Likewise, currents of cold water will chill the air, making the local climates colder and less hospitable for life. Such is the case in Maine and New York, which are chilled by the Labrador Current coming down from the waters of Greenland and the Canadian Shield. If these ocean currents are destabilized and warmer water is somehow flushed against the coasts of New England, the cold water fish and the birds that prey on them will all be driven out of the area. The maritime ecological shift will have ripple effects deeper into the terrestrial ecologies, and just like in areas flooded by warm water, the entire habitat shifts and changes. Native species are driven out, and this opens up niches for other species to adapt to and exploit. Warmer ocean water also means less ice. Since ice reflects light, but water absorbs it, this only accelerates the heating process. We all know what happens when ice melts. It becomes liquid water. When the ice sheets and glaciers of the world begin melting faster and faster, the liquid water literally raises the sea level. A rising sea level can be disastrous for lowland ecologies like wetlands and swamps, as they would become totally submerged. All of the swamp-dwelling creatures, like various alligators and frogs and birds, would be pushed out of their habitat, deeper into dry land. This could pose a serious threat to their existence, as many of these species cannot readily handle living in a drier, more rugged landscape. 
Rising sea levels would also drown all the world's beaches, taking with them most of the species that live there, like the crabs and fish and birds whose lives depend on the shallow water ecology. And since the accumulation of mineral particles that makes a beach can take hundreds of thousands of years, the world simply won't have these habitats anymore, not until the gradual pounding of ocean currents deposits enough silt on the world's shores to recreate them. Because evolution is opportunistic, responding in real time to present real-world challenges, a warmer ocean that creeps higher onto land will create ample evolutionary opportunities. By pushing marine and coastal organisms deeper inland, they'll be forced to adapt to the drier air and greater temperature extremes. Species driven away from the equator by the heat will find themselves forced to confront seasonal changes in the day-night cycle, as well as lower temperatures and lower humidity. If any amphibians are able to survive the brutal mass extinction that they're currently experiencing, their future evolution will likely involve a drier, thicker skin that protects them from the cold, dry air, or they might see a greater use of behaviors like hibernation to survive in their new habitats. On the other hand, ocean levels rising and filling the lowlands would bring bodies of water closer to regions that are historically quite dry. This intrusion of water would make the local climates more humid, and the humidity would retain heat, which would act to minimize the day-night temperature differences. Much like how warm currents and warm air supports the rainforest on the southern Alaska coastlines, warm water in the Central American plains could support a denser ecology of wooded grassland, temperate forests, and maybe even all-out temperate rainforests in the middle of the continent. If this happens, it would encourage the proliferation of rainforest life while pushing out those native organisms better suited to the drier conditions. Okay, back to the oceans. As industry and consumer activity pumps carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, more carbon dioxide dissolves into the oceans, and the water becomes more acidic. This increased acidity might seem like a rather abstract thing, but it has very measurable, tangible consequences. The acidity, or the pH, of the ocean determines how well minerals are cycled and how they can chemically interact. With rising levels of ocean acidity, Species that use calcium salts or some other mineral to build their shells or their exoskeletons are finding themselves unable to do so. Among these organisms are the polyps of the coral reefs, which can't form their carbonate shells in acidic conditions. As has happened with the Great Barrier Reef of Australia, this can lead to tremendously destructive coral bleaching, where the corals slowly die and lose their color, becoming brittle and bony white. Coral reefs, like the Great Barrier Reef, form ecological oases, little, dense explosions of life bursting out of the barren wastes of an otherwise desolate ocean floor. With the destruction of the Great Barrier Reef and other coral reefs will come the collapse of an extremely valuable ecological resource. The coral reefs are home to thousands of species of fish and plant, of mollusks, crustaceans, worms, sponges, octopuses, and more. All of these groups will get pushed to extinction as the coral reefs struggle to persist in the acidic oceans. To survive the collapse of their habitats, these reef-dwelling organisms will have to find new habitats that offer some of the things they needed from the reefs, things like protection from predators or stable food supplies, and communities of organisms that interact mutualistically. Okay, let's move out of the oceans and onto dry land. How do terrestrial plants and other animals respond to climate change? How will this influence their evolution into the immediate future? Plants have experienced a huge shift in their selection pressures. Those plants that we humans cultivate for food are most secure. Corns, grains, squash, tomatoes, potatoes, rice, all of these plants and more have had their evolutionary trajectory shackled to the commercial and industrial momentum of human societies. Because these species are so important to us, we alter their genomes at the level of the nucleotide to make them fit our needs and purposes. The immediate future of the evolution of these plants is almost entirely at the hands of the humans who cultivate and genetically modify them. And due to this genetic meddling, plants like tomatoes have longer shelf lives, apples can endure prolonged oxygen exposure without browning, and potatoes are disease-resistant. Other plants are given traits or modifications that make them resistant to drought, or to insectoid parasites, or to any number of other problems. In a way, our genetic modification is like a hyper-accelerated, hyper-focused form of evolution. I mean, 
it's not evolution. It, it's not right to call it evolution because it's kind of the exact opposite. These changes aren't due to natural selection. They're due to artificial selection. It's not random mutations and opportunistic adaptations. It's deliberate alterations of specific genes for desired outcomes. To fortify plants and ensure their existence and proliferation, we're basically giving them 50 million years worth of evolutionary development with just a few years of focused lab work. Outside the lab, other plants are forced to endure the change in climate on their own, without the benefit of human interference. A serious problem is the predicted collapse of angiosperm populations. You see, flowering plants form symbiotic relationships with pollinating insects. As the insects fly from plant to plant to gather nectar, they get coated in the plant's pollen, and this pollen gets carried from plant to plant where fertilization can happen. Our industrial use of pesticides like neonicotinoids has been devastating for species of pollinating insects, most famously bees. The bee populations crashed in the years leading up to 2013 and led many people to fear for the future of the species. You might have read the headlines a few years ago talking about stuff like colony collapse disorder. A bee collapse would necessarily be associated with a collapse of most or all of the plant species that depend on those bees for pollination. It's possible that the threat of pollinator extinction will put pressure on angiosperm populations to adapt ways to reproduce and pollinate without relying on fragile insect species. This might involve using the wind, like other pollinator plants, or it might involve the use of a new insect which adapts to fill the niche left open by the bees. Alright, so enough about all the animals and plants and whatnot. Enough about how they'll evolve. You want me to get to the good part. The part about human evolution. It poses some fascinating questions, like what evolutionary selection pressures are working on us today in our urban environments and interconnected cultures? How is genetic drift quietly altering the gene pool with its random fluctuations? What known or newly discovered mutations in the human genome are beneficial and seem to be spreading? And more generally, where is this collective tide of evolutionary movement taking us? What will our descendants look like in 5 million years? 10 million? A hundred? If any descendants of the humble Homo sapiens still exist a billion years into the future, what will they look like? What will they be like? Naturally, these questions are very difficult to answer, and those last questions almost impossible. But data can be taken and estimates made, and to a degree limited by the functional capacity of our tools and tactics, we can make short-term predictions with decent accuracy. And we can make long-term predictions, but these are inherently a little bit fuzzier. If the human species satisfied the Hardy-Weinberg hypothesis, we wouldn't be evolving at all. No mutations, no gene flow, no genetic drift, and no natural selection. Well, it's pretty obvious that we're still subject to mutations. The human gene pool is characterized by thousands of alleles, and mutations continue to alter existing alleles and create new ones. Think of a few mutations that could emerge in human populations, which would be able to persist in the gene pool and spread. When I think about this as practically as possible, I think that things you can't see, like some kind of internal biochemistry, or at most, things like new eye colors or hair colors and other cosmetic mutations would be most likely to persist while mutations that cause visceral deformities or medical complications will obviously be selected against. Mutations that increase muscle density, or that improve the capacity of the body to metabolize fats, or that reduce the risk of heart disease, all of these potentially beneficial alleles and more currently exist in the human species, and they could possibly persist long into the future, perhaps even going to fixation one day, thousands of years into the future, where every single human alive either has this allele or doesn't. I think the most striking example of human evolution exists in the people of Tibet, who have for thousands of years lived at altitudes much higher than almost every other human population. Studies have found that about 34 mutations have emerged in the Tibetan population in the 2800 years since they've diverged from their Han Chinese cousins. One of these mutated genes, called EPAS1, or EPAS1, allows them to thrive in the low-oxygen, high-altitude environment of Tibet. The allele exists in nearly 90% of Tibetans, and less than 10% of Han Chinese, which means it's indicative of a major evolutionary division. The mutated allele hasn't been extensively studied, but it's believed to balance anaerobic and aerobic respiration to make Tibetan cells much more oxygen efficient. As a result, the Tibetans can engage in physical activity at high altitudes without the rapid exhaustion and delirium that affects everyone else at similar altitudes. 
This is perhaps the most obvious and significant example of evolutionary divergence between human populations. Gene flow is obviously still affecting the human species, perhaps more so than at any other time in human history. Modern technology like commercial aviation and oceanic shipping has enabled a global culture of interconnectedness. People have more opportunity to migrate to other areas and integrate into foreign populations than they've ever had before. Economically, technologically, sociologically, all the factors are there that enable people to spread and interbreed. This has the effect of reducing diversity between population groups, as alleles from each group get shared and spread and integrated across the others. With more and more people migrating and marrying into their host cultures, this gene flow has really accelerated. As people continue to interbreed across national and geographic boundaries, the genetic differences that defined us a hundred years ago will slowly fade away as the human population as a whole becomes much more genetically homogenous. Despite this increase in gene flow, our populations are still being affected by genetic drift. Genetic drift is like the background noise, the random fluctuations of allele frequencies that shape greater genetic trends. Mating within the human species is largely non-random. A Chinese person is much more likely to mate with a Chinese person than they are a Canadian, and vice versa. There are numerous sociological and cultural barriers that prevent truly random mating, like wealth differences, religious or political differences, and aesthetic preferences. This rolls into natural selection, which includes the sexual selection present between females and males as they compete within their gender groups for a chance to mate. While human populations aren't really affected by predators anymore, we're still vulnerable to diseases and cultural selection pressures. Diseases can evolve rapidly, and the emergence of antibiotic-resistant bacteria means the defenses of modern medicine might not hold out for much longer. We might be long overdue for a plague or some other pathogen to clean out an overpopulated house. Culturally, there are strict pressures put on individuals to compete. People have to work and participate in a fast-paced modern world in order to gather the resources necessary to reproduce and raise healthy children. This kind of global, industrial worker culture presents a set of pressures, and human beings, as a population of individuals with variable qualities, respond with varying success to these pressures. Those that can fit in and thrive in our competitive economic arenas are more likely to thrive and produce healthy offspring than those who don't. Those that can find a role to play in the modern world will find their traits to be advantageous, while those who can't adapt to the changing world will be left behind, ideologically and over a longer period of time, genetically. We are becoming more intelligent, better at abstract thinking, and better at three-dimensional visualizations. Remember how I described the genetic modification of plants was like creating a guided, hyper-accelerated form of evolution? Well, if we can do this to plants, we can do this to people. Researchers in China have already started using technologies like CRISPR to alter the genomes of human embryos. The technology to alter our own genes is here, today, right now. If we really use human genetic modification to its maximum potential, the future of human evolution is really an open book. We could be whatever we want to be. Whatever we can design, we can create. By implanting genes from other organisms into our own bodies, we might be able to give ourselves traits that right now only exist in those animals, like how birds can detect magnetic fields, or how mongooses can shake off the effects of snake venom, or dogs with their superior sense of smell. Any trait that we can isolate to a discrete number of genes, we can possibly isolate and transplant into our own bodies, into our own cells, into our own DNA that gets passed on to our children. Of course, this brings up a host of ethical considerations. Is it ethical to deliberately change the genome of an embryo? Is it ethical to change your own genome in such a way that the changes will be passed down to your offspring? You might think, well, I wanted this gene change, but if it gets passed on to your child, that's an elective procedure that you're getting that they don't have a say in, but will affect them anyway. There's a really big ethical dilemma here. These questions might seem straightforward if we're treating genetic diseases, but the conversation drives very quickly into a deep shade of gray when we start talking about cosmetic and elective modifications. If you're excited by the concept of predicting the future evolution of life on Earth and you want to know more, consider a TV series called The Future is Wild. It's a documentary of sorts where the creators interview various biological, physical, and theoretical scientists, and they hypothesize what life would be like 5 million, 100 million, and 200 million years into the future. 
Mind you, it's not hard science because you can't really predict evolution. Evolution is opportunistic, not deterministic. But it's a fun little exercise in making evolutionary hypotheses. <sighs> All right, well, I think that's a good way to wrap up this episode. I hope this episode gave you food for your brain. I hope it inspired you to think about how life will adapt and respond to our current industrialization, and how life may respond in the distant future to our own extinction or to our deliberate abandonment of the Earth. As always, thanks for listening. Would you like to support the Biologic Podcast? It's super easy. When you open a new episode, press the like button or share it with your friends. If you aren't subscribed, you should hit the subscribe button so you can enjoy a new episode every week. You can also peruse our official store, which has a ton of cool stuff like hand-designed t-shirts, hoodies, and stickers. All the links you need are in the description section below.